Thank you very much. Um, I'm in a, I, 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 you know, I, I wear the jacket for the obligatory jacket, but it's warm in here, so, and I, I never teach, you know, I, my, my native habitat is a t-shirt and jeans, so um, this is a, a, so I've worn the jacket, you saw the jacket. Uh, <laughs> Tell my wife I wore the jacket. Um, so, the, so the first thing I have to do is, you know, the, in this paper, uh, uh, you'll see I have a number of co-authors on this paper. Uh, so far, they actually haven't seen the results on this paper. So this is very preliminary in terms of what we're doing here. Um, the experiment itself is one that we actually uh, have, have done quite a bit. As, as Sue mentioned, it's one that actually uh, was one of the kind of rare instances in my career where you know, somebody in, in government really said, look, there's something we can learn from this and really think about trying to apply the principles here uh, in, in a larger area. Um, one of the things that I recommend to doctoral students is oftentimes that you, when you try to do one project, you know, try to hit the home run, but as you're trying to hit the home run, uh, embed some other projects in there in terms of your data collection so you have some options. And one of the things we were really interested in understanding was the role of information. And especially when we think about a high school uh, student, what kind of information do they want when they're thinking about whether they go to college? And was there a way for us to provide that and to provide that in a very customized way that might help those students. And so we're going to come to that. Um, so, uh, so the project, you know, does early information improve college access? By early information here, what we're trying to get at is information uh, in the earlier part of their high school careers as opposed to information in their senior year. Okay? Now, in terms of, uh, so the first place I'm going to start with is a nice little quote. And the quote is, a high school senior anywhere in this great land of ours can apply to any college or any university in any of the 50 states and not be turned away because his family is poor. Who said, oh, come on. Sorry. You had it. Uh, so for those of you who weren't listening, uh, the, uh, this was Lyndon Johnson, actually, in, in 1965. And at the time. Okay. <laughs> I can't argue. <laughs> you know, uh, so, so later on I'll have to tell some stories about Sue, and, and she can tell some stories about <laughs> Sue. Let's see how this seminar goes. We might spend the last 20 minutes sh swapping stories here. <laughs> so what I wanted to, you know, if you think about that quote in 1965, in 1965, and, if, and as you kind of shoot forward, one of the things that we have in the United States is just a persistent gap between low-income families and high-income families. Uh, the bottom 40%, you know, we're somewhere between a, about a 25% gap. And while, they're going, while the poorest uh, families in the United States are going to school at a higher rate, there's still that gap. And the gap, for, for in many ways, is a puzzle. And as you start to think about different reasons why that gap might exist, there's a number of different reasons why you might throw out there. One of them is, is just the differences in academic preparation. They go to different high schools. There's different qualities. You know, it's certainly a viable explanation. It's not one that I'm going to go down, but it's certainly part that contributes. The second one is just thinking, you know, these are low-income families. They have less resources. They have, and so thinking about the, the relationship of aid. The two that we're going to talk about today, the first one is information. And the idea here on information is, does the family have information? You think about what information does. Information is the core of our expectations. As I'm going to talk about it here in a second, the core of our kind of models of decision making means that we, we are going to look at the kind of net benefits and the net costs of any, and net benefits of two different things. And we might make an investment if the net benefit in that investment is higher than the net benefit of some alternative investment. Well, how do we know the net benefits? It's, we think it's through information. And so one of the things we want to try to help students understand is both the benefits as well as the costs and some information about those things. And we'll come back and we're going to talk a lot about that. And the other one is on complexity. And it's going to be kind of one of the things in the background here because in this particular realm of financial aid, it's very hard to separate the two. Oftentimes information is about how to navigate complex processes. And the complexity is going to be one of those things that we think is going to deter individuals. And if you've taken a class from Sue, uh, assuming that Sue, uh, you know, toots her own horn, which she should in, the, in, in this. Higher education lectures. Edinger Donarski trivia class. So if we want, we can go and I can tell some stories about Kevin soon. Because Kevin was an undergraduate in one of the classes that I uh, TA'd when I was uh, uh, a long time ago in a, in a macro galaxy long way. 
So um, the, the point that I want to make on this complexity is this is a place where there's a lot of active uh, work going on here. And when we started this project, most of the information was actually, most of the, the kind of policy initiatives were at the information phase. And that's where I think people had really kind of pushed very hard. And as time has gone on, in part because of the other paper, um, just in part because of the literature we're learning more, we've realized that perhaps somewhere down here, which invites kind of behavioral solutions to help people overcome these small barriers. And in particular, one of the things, if you go and you look at, we have a lot of uh, studies, most by Sue, uh, that suggest that there's this impact of aid. But as we look at the impact of aid, one of the things that's interesting is the places where aid has had the most impact are also the places where information has been the most plentiful to students, as well as the processes to acquire the aid have actually been the simplest. Okay? So, so it's hard, you know, as we start to think about this relationship of aid policy, it's in, somehow embedded into this, in these notions of information and complexity. The other one is just more generally, uh, as we think about these behavioral notions, these nudges, uh, there's quite a bit of work right now being done. And so if you're looking for kind of a good dissertation, this is a good place to start to think about these principles, and, and we'll talk about them. Now, this is a, a slide. I'm going to use uh, a lot of Sue's work here. This is a slide from uh, Sudanarski and Judith Scott Clayton's paper. And one of the things that they tried to do is to try to demonstrate the timing of the process of trying to go to college. So many of you remember back, you know, some, some fall, a long time ago, when you were thinking about going to college, and you started to actually get your stuff together to apply to a college. You applied to a college. Well, the process, if you're a low-income individual, for getting that financial aid comes sometime after your taxes are done, you're going to submit this FAFSA form. As many of you, how many of you people have done a FAFSA? How many of you enjoyed every minute of it? I did a fast for one year, but my, my, uh, my, my, my father refused to do it in the second year because it was telling Big Brother too many things about us. Um, I've always appreciated that and, and my student loans. Um, <laughs> So what's going to happen is after that FAFSA comes, now it's a little bit more streamlined because of uh, the online nature of it, but at the time that we were writing this, there was a significant lag between the time that you would submit the FAFSA and the time that the information would come back. Now the hard part is, if you're a student, like think about just economics. If I'm going to go buy a good, what good is there that I buy where I don't know the actual price of the good until almost six months after I've actually indicated a willingness to buy the good. But that's what higher education largely does. We indicate over here in the fall that we want to buy the good or make the investment, but we don't know the actual cost of the investment until after all of this processing has happened, oftentimes up until March of, of, our sen of the senior year in high school. And so one of the things we do right now is we provide information right here to students, but that information, it's, it's, it's not always transparent. And so one of the things that we, you know, trying to understand this was we wanted to really say, well, where are the informational barriers and how can we try to break those barriers? Okay. Now, in terms of the FAFSA, at the time we did this, this was the FAFSA in all of its gory detail. Um, there's actually a number of good papers talking about the complexity of the FAFSA. So, you know, just kind of reinforcing that there's both informational issues and complexity issues here we have to deal with. Now, I put this in here because I, I wasn't quite sure, you know, how many people are economists by nature uh, in the ed school when we, uh, when we uh, at Stanford, you know, because we're not the best program. In fact, we're number five this year. Um, number one in education policy, but number five. Um, <laughs> one of the things that happens at, uh, is, you know, almost it's always sociologists who, who come to my talks there. And, and so as soon as I start talking human capital model, I immediately they, they, they turn off. Um, but the basic idea that I already kind of started to think about is the way that we think that people make decisions is that pe we think, as economists, that people basically weigh two different alternatives and what the benefits are going to be over a lifetime. A lot of times we, we talk about the monetary benefits uh, and the cost. So we think about, you know, what kind of earnings I could have from this major, how, what it's going to cost me to go to this college versus another college. But we also mean the kind of non-monetary benefits as well. Um, those other benefits that accrue from actually accomplishing a college degree. Um, as we're thinking about this, the place where we're kind of stuck is when we look at the numbers, we think that a lot of these low-income families should be making decisions and we don't understand why. And I just want to illustrate that there are good reasons why they may be choosing to underinvest. For example, you might have individuals who realize that the cost that they're going to incur in terms of tr the effort that they're going to have to do in college is just too high. 
And so they don't want to invest that, and that might be a very rational reason why I don't invest in kind of human capital in, in one reason or another. Um, others might actually have a realistic idea of what the returns to college might be, and they might see that for their particular case, it might actually be that the returns are too low to actually justify going to college. Again, that's a good reason to actually choose not to go to college. Bad reasons have to do with if we start to think about the numbers and we have the numbers wrong. So for example, in our sample, one of the things we asked families was how much would it cost for the tuition at a two-year college? Any ideas what tuition at a two-year college, now we're in 2008 is when we're, we're talking about. Anybody have any ideas for just tuition? No, not fees, but just how much would tuition be at a two-year college in Ohio or North Carolina? Isaac. For annual. Annual credit, okay, thousand fifteen hundred. Other thoughts. Too low, too high, too low. way too low. Your guess is accurate. The average family in our sample was guessing ten thousand dollars. The truth is three thousand dollars. Now, if you're thinking about a family who's making a calculation where they're thinking about the costs and the benefits of going to college, and they have in mind that college costs $10,000 a year, and it doesn't cost $10,000 a year, they're handicapping that decision. Now, I would call that a bad reason why an individual might actually make a bad decision in that human capital model. And, and so one of the things we want to try to sort out is if we can fix some of these places where they might uh, misestimate the costs or misestimate the benefits, then we might be in a, a position where we could actually improve their decision making. Okay? as 10. So did you do any follow-up questions where you sort of said, say it were 3,000, would you consider that something you could pull off? We didn't. Um, we didn't do any questions, but as I'll show you, in most of the, what, what we're going to actually show them as part of our intervention is that the tuition is 3,000, and for, mo for most of our sample, you know, the Pell Grant that, and the state grant that they're going to get would actually cover the tuition. So. Okay, so, you know, I've already made a few of these points. There's a few other kind of extra points that I want to try to make about information in this process. One of them is in terms of the FAFSA. Now, we're getting to a point that people really recognize the FAFSA. At the time that we were really starting this research, uh, there was still somewhat of low visibility. Uh, there's some estimates that about a million students who could have received aid were not actually filing FAFSAs. Um, the other one is late information. Um, you know, th this goes back to this kind of idea earlier that we, you know, we're, we're not actually learning what the price is until very late in the process. And then the missed deadlines becomes a, an important one. In the state of Ohio, where our research was largely based, uh, there's a deadline basically at uh, March 1st. If your application's in by that point, you're guaranteed aid. If it comes in after March 1st, basically if there's aid left, it's yours, but if it's too late. And for a lot of our students, we're going to see that actually some of their applications were going in in July or m m well after the deadline of having kind of a guarantee. Um, when you look at the research, there's a few that are going to be kind of nice causal study. I'm going to show you those. At the time we started this, most of the stuff was very descriptive. So for example, uh, Sally Mays done a, a series of, of, of you know, basically surveys of low-income families asking them, what do you think about information? And so what you'll see here is the lowest income families are the families who basically say we either agree or strongly agree that we needed more information about financial aid. And largely those were the minority groups as well who were kind of more likely to be the ones saying that we need that. When you ask students if, they're, if they would have made different choices had they had better information, you're getting basically somewhere around 59% of students saying that they would have made different choices had they had information. And it was a survey like this survey that kind of led people to kind of say this information must really matter. We if had we had that different information, they might have made different choices. The other one, just to kind of lay out some other places, the College Board has two different panels that have convened. One was Rethinking Financial Aid, and one of their, uh, their big uh, adaptations was the Donarski Postcard. And, you know, the Donarski postcard was basically this idea of using the tax return to generate information for the family to help project them uh, what their finances would look like in college and help them start to understand what might be available. Uh, Sue and I just participated in another panel that was very similar, thinking about the future. And again, information played a part in terms of the recommendations we had at the end of the day, though they're a little bit more nuanced. 
Um, advisory uh, Committee on Student Financial Aid has been uh, playing the kind of information card for some time. And some of the early efforts by the Department of Ed was all about trying to improve information. Um, as recently as you know, a year and a half ago, I was on the phone with the White House, and the basic uh, charge to us was come up with some ideas to improve financial aid that didn't cost any money. And so you know, it turns out that providing information is a pretty cheap way to do things. And, and that's about the only thing you can do without much money. Um, there are, this isn't the first paper, and there's been a number of papers that have started to explore more of this information. The ones that you might be familiar with, which I think are really gaining ground, and in particular the, uh, the recent paper by Hoxby and Turner has received quite a bit of press, is on thinking about this kind of mismatch hypothesis, that there's some students that don't have the right information about you know, kind of what college they might be able to succeed at. And if we provide that information, we might actually be able to change decisions. And, and Hoxby and Turner basically targeted kind of the low income, top 4% of all students nationally, uh, finding students who were unsupported, provided information and a little bit of aid in terms of uh, fee waivers. And they were able to get those students to, instead of applying to kind of homegrown schools, to really switch their menu of schools to more selective schools. Um, other places, the counseling program, Boston Coach, um, Tom Kane and uh, Chris Avery ran a project for many years out of the Kennedy School where they would go into kind of the inner city schools and really try to elicit what the students expected in terms of costs and benefits. And they actually made the claim that uh, students basically had a pretty good accurate model of the uh, human capital model, but they tended to uh, essentially not only increase the cost of college, but also increase the benefits that they might expect. Um, there's a few other ones that are kind of interesting. I'm going to come back to this paper uh, later. It's one of my favorite papers, uh, the student loan paper. One of the things uh, in the Netherlands, they have an, a nice student loan program, and so they w but they had low take up. So they invited students in and they uh, essentially uh, randomized which students they gave information about that program. And then they basically sat back to see if, uh, if students made some change their decisions, had greater take up in their treatment group. Now I'll come back a little bit later and tell you what they actually found. But the other thing they did which was really interesting was they also gave a post-test to the students to see if they still remembered the information. And lo and behold, the students in the treatment group really understood better the student loan program. Okay. Um, there's some other ones that uh, Phil Oriopoulos has worked on in Canada. Again, finding this evidence that, at least soft evidence, that somehow uh, providing information might change uh, decision making. It didn't change their behavior. Well, I told you I was going to come back to it later. Because, uh, you know, as, as a preview of upcoming attractions, we're going to have a whole lot of zeros today. And this is at least one that uh, suggested that we should have uh, seen that coming. Okay. Now, um, in terms of our experiment, uh, back in 2007 or so, H&R Block was taking a beating in the press uh, just because of the way their business model, uh, which you know, really thrives on kind of high fees and, and, uh, for short-term loans. And so H&R Block basically asked for a call for proposals about things that they might be able to do uh, to kind of community outreach. It was also their business development group, but that never materialized for them. One of the things that's interesting about H&R Block is they're a pretty good firm for thinking about trying to help students with financial aid. They specialize in trying to make complex forms simple. Um, it's about three quarters of all welfare recipients go to a place like H&R Block to do their taxes. So it's a nice venue. Um, most of their clientele, actually at the time we were looking, had adjusted gross incomes under 40,000. In the year we were interested in, 45,000 for a family of two would have got you a Pell Grant. Okay. So, so they were a good partner in many ways. The other thing that was really nice was they were sc scalable. If we could get it to work in H&R Block, it'd be easy to think about actually putting this in many tax centers. And I'll come back at the end and tell you what we're trying to do now. Um, so what we basically did was we would come in, the individual would come in and do their taxes. And our software was kind of embedded in their tax software. And we would look to see if they had an income under 45,000. Well, if they had an income under 45,000, then we looked for a college, somebody who was kind of college age. And we defined that fairly liberally as being 15 to 30, the 15 and 16 year olds being those sophomores and juniors that we wanted to understand a bit more. And then those 17 year old to 30 year olds being those who really you know, might be in a position to go to college next year. And we broadly focused on three different groups. Dependents were basically the high school seniors. And uh, uh, our IRB actually forced us to, we couldn't actually do the 18-year-olds because the students aren't in the office with their parents. 
And so we couldn't do the 18-year-olds because we would need their consent. So we had to focus on those who were, high, who were kind of young for their, they were 17-year-olds in the, in the spring of their senior year. The independents were those who basically, we didn't need their parents' information. They were either over the age of 24, or they had a child, or they were married, or they were a veteran, or an orphan. Any one of the conditions that would make it to where their parents' finances were irrelevant and all that mattered was their own tax return. And then the final group, which is really the group I'm going to try to focus on, is this group of high school sophomores and juniors. And with this group of high school and sophomores and juniors, what we really identified was the parents of these individuals, and we provided information to the parents. Now, it was the same model in terms of the dependents, but as you'll see, we actually have a very different result in the dependents versus the independents, okay, or versus these uh, high school sophomores and juniors. So just to walk through kind of the experiment, so for the high school and seniors and the independents, they come in, they do their taxes. It's about a 45 minute process uh, if you're there. Our software would identify and we'd have a few additional questions to gather some information and then we'd have a consent form. After the consent form, we implement a randomization. Now in our main one, which is the study we've already published, we had th three different groups. Group number one was about FAFSA simplification, assistance, and information. We included information here, but we also tried to simplify the, this kind of complex process for them. These were kids who, were on the, who could potentially go to college in that same year, and so it made sense for us to try to help them actually file the FAFSA, you know, as kind of the extreme case. So you can think about this part being kind of information and assistance. We also provided a second treatment group just with information, and I'll tell you exactly what we mean by that in a second and show you an example. And then we had a control group. Now, H&R Block really wanted everybody to feel like they were getting something, and so the control group, it's you know, somewhat unsatisfying if you sign a consent form and then we're like, thanks, goodbye. And so uh, we actually uh, provided a little brochure about the benefits of college to everybody. So, you know, and, and that affected all three groups. Now, I can't tell you the impact of that, um, you know, we tried to make that as general as possible, just basically as something that if you were to just Google benefits from college, you'd probably come up with yourself, because uh, we, we wanted it intentionally not to have an impact, but it was something there that we, you know, so we're going to focus in terms of our information more on the cost side, because we've already provided information on the benefits in a different way. Okay. Now, just to kind of outline what we mean in that FAFSA treatment group, one of the things we did was we basically said, look, You've just told us everything in your taxes. It's, it's almost two-thirds of the information from the, in the FAFSA come from the tax return. And so the first thing we did was we wrote a crosswalk where those fields in their tax return, we would just automatically grab that data and put it in a FAFSA form for them. The second thing that happened is this personal assistance where essentially we created this kind of interview then that would go through and ask whatever questions were missing. And then the final part here, we would actually give them information, and I'm going to come back, this is the same information that we're, we're going to talk about in terms of what we're doing, but the key thing was it was very personalized, both in terms of location, as well as in terms of their finances and eligibility. Okay. And then the final thing that was kind of interesting was the Department of Education, as a pilot, allowed us to actually submit the FAFSA. So just like when you hit that button, you know, I did it at 11.45 on uh, Monday night to send my taxes to, to Washington, uh, we could do the same thing with the FAFSA. As soon as we basically hit that form, essentially their FAFSA was automatically transmitted. Uh, one thing that's interesting is this is actually something the Department of Education is going to institute in uh, tax year uh, 2014. We've been pushing hard on this part and it's finally going to happen, we believe. Um, the information only group, you know, basically we're just going to provide information but we're not going to help them at all with the FAFSA. We're going to basically say, look, there's this form called the FAFSA, and if you fill it out, this is the type of benefit you're going to get. Okay. Now, in the group that we're going to focus on for most of what I want to try to do today, it was the high school sophomores and juniors, and it doesn't make any sense for us to actually fill out their FAFSA for them. Th they can't submit it for another year or two years, and, and uh, the finances you know, in that year are somewhat irrelevant, but to the extent that they're related to what the future finances might be, they might give us a picture. And so all we did with them was really that information. But the key thing in that information that we said was, we basically said, if the student was to go to college this year, this is what the financial aid package would look like. Okay? Now this is what our information looks like. So this is a student from Cleveland. And it basically says, look, it appears that you're eligible for, in this case, the student was eligible for about $3,500 in state and federal aid. Now that's a big difference from what, for those of you who've had your kind of student aid report, your student aid report typically tells you your EFC, how much you can pay, um, and you have to wait until you get that price from the, the, the financial aid office. But what we basically said is, look, this is how much aid is sitting out there for you. 
And then what we did was we knew where they lived and we chose the four public colleges that were closest to them, making sure to have at least some two-year and some four-year options. And then we showed what the tuition would look like. So the tuition at Cleveland State in this year was almost $8,000. And then there were three community colleges ranging from $3,300 to about $2,900 in terms of their cost. And we put that right next to how much they'd be eligible in eight. Okay. Um, for a few students who had lower eligibility, we'd also provide a little bit more information about government loans. Um, but it wasn't a big part of what we were trying to do. This part uh, here was the big part of our information. Now, one of the hard parts in this part, or you know, kind of going forward, in some sense what we were trying to do is replicate the information that at the time policymakers were advocating. If we gave students this type of information, it might change their decisions. And so that's what we were trying to do. Now, looking through, you know, kind of five years after the fact, as we start to think about this information, it's not clear that this is the right information. And that's a, a fair criticism of this project to say, well, well, you should have provided different information. And this is, you know, in some sense, we made the best choice at the time we had. But I want to come back to that because if we find no effect, one of the hard parts is, did we just provide the wrong information to them? Um, and if we provided the wrong information, then of course there wasn't an impact on it. Okay. Um, questions up till there? Yeah, please, John. Well, I don't understand. What's the difference between the first two and the last two columns? Oh, the last two are if you're part time. Um, you, you know, we actually, this uh, text box here where we amplified the text covers up this. You can see the bottom of the, it. It actually said if you were to go half time, this is what your financial aid, and all the awards are just halved, and the tuition as well. There's another question over here. Um, why were you not allowed to include 18-year-old college seniors? <laughs> the issue that we had was uh, the first year in our pilot year, we actually tried to do them. And our IRB wanted their signatures on a piece of paper saying that they were going to, per that they uh, consented to be involved in the research study. Well, the problem was uh, the 18 year old's not with the parent doing their taxes. Um, how many times did you do your, 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 you know, were you sitting with your parents when they were doing their taxes or having that conversation? And so what we, we tried our first year was we literally had these $50 gift cards that we would send home with the parents, and if they sent back the, the consent form, we would then activate the card. And uh, you know, we had like five return the entire season. Um, you know, it, was, it was actually very difficult for us to get the 18-year-olds. It's also one of the places where IRBs were learning at the time. You know, we were winding up in, in uh, this is a case where we actually had electronic consent throughout the way. And because of the fact that this was a low risk project to the individual, could really only bring them benefits. Uh, today an IRB would probably approve us doing an 18 year olds. In fact, we, we did get a waiver for this year when we did 18 year olds. But at the time, uh, the IRBs weren't willing to do that. Um, so it's a big omission. 18, 19, 20 year olds are basically just out of the study altogether. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. You mentioned earlier that um, people could uh, automatically have their FAFSA information submitted or they could do it manually. That's right. Were you able to tell who did and who did not opt to do it manually? Or, we know, were, and I'll come back to that because one of the things that we're going to see is we, we're going to have a big impact on both you know, filing the form as well as attendance in the FAFSA project, not in the information project. And a lot of, if, you know, it's, it, there's a little bit of selection here, and I'll come back and talk about it. But basically, most of that comes through the people who filled it out at the moment um, and basically had everything submitted before they left the office. Yeah. Okay, yeah. What is it that you implemented in the 2015 tax year? Uh, the, oh, the 2014 uh, tax year? Uh, essentially, right now, uh, if you were to go into an H&R Block office or any tax office today, if you wanted to do their FAS, the FAFSA, they'd have to log in and do FAFSA on the web. And what the Department of Education is, is claiming that they're going to have ready for next tax season is an interface where a tax preparer would actually be able to upload your information to FAFSA on the web and it would just populate FAFSA on the web for you. And so that's one of the things they're trying to do is to make it to where it's more seamless with your taxes. And would there be allowed charge a lot for that? No, no, no. What they're going to do is actually you have to actually provide the plan of how it's going to help low-income families before you actually get permission to actually, you know, make this uh, decision and they'll be auditing those. Okay, so the key things that we're going to look at here is we, our kind of research question is we want to understand if this information influences, one, did they submit the FAFSA? And we think of that as kind of a baseline, right? If, if they really understand that this FAFSA is important, then hopefully if this, if this information has kind of piqued their curiosity about their eligibility, they're going to get the form in. Okay. Number two, we can track college attendance. 
And number three, we can actually look at whether they actually receive financial aid. Now, the college attendance, we're going to rely largely on the National Student Clearinghouse, but we also have data from the Department of Education. So if they actually went to a school that's not covered by um, the National Student Clearinghouse, but yet they receive financial aid, we'll be able to observe them as well. Okay? So this one here basically is, is the universe of all students who are going to attend and actually receive aid who did their FAFSA. So in any randomized experiment, the first thing you worry about is, did we get it right? Did we actually have some kind of nice randomization? And in our case, we think we did. I mean, essentially, we had an algorithm based on the last two digits of Social Security numbers. The last two digits of Social Security numbers are uniformly distributed throughout the population. And so basically, uh, we had the last two digits corresponding to whether they would be in a treatment or control. Um, in all of our focus groups, nobody ever guessed that that's what we actually did. Um, and so we think that we were in a nice position to, you know, kind of make it to where the tax professionals couldn't cheat and put people into the, uh, the other one. If indeed we have a good experiment, then just a simple T statistic, or in our case we're going to run basically a, a very simple regression of our outcome on whether they were in that complete FAFSA treatment or whether they were in the information treatment. And then, of course, in the high school sophomores and juniors, they weren't in that main treatment. They weren't eligible for that kind of extra assistance. So it'll just be really, uh, is there a difference by whether they were randomly assigned to this treatment group? Sometimes this is called our kind of intent to treat effect. Okay. Now, the first thing I want to show you is this is a table that H&R Block prepared for us because we actually did not have the data on individuals who did not consent. So what you'll see over here in the first column is the number of people who are software determined might be eligible for the study. Now what's a little bit hard is up here the dependents, you know, I put high school seniors, this actually is not just high school seniors, this is all the sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Okay? Now it, what you'll see is here's all the people who were families that were flagged as being eligible. The next question we say is, well, are you interested in knowing more about college? And 15 as in 15 left? Or 15 as in? Okay. Okay. Let's just have fun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So the uh, so what you'll see here is pretty even, and all of these are kind of proportions of the original group. Now the place where I want to kind of draw your attention, where we did have a problem in this study, you know, pretty much we're pretty good up until here in terms of finishing the office interview. But one of the things that happened was H&R Block wanted an electronic consent in the process, but the IRB wanted written consents. And so what they would do is they would print the consent at the end of the study. Well, the problem we had is H&R Block, when they print things, they print things first, the printout that stays in the office, second, all the printout that stays home. They would do two copies of our consent form, one that was supposed to go home, one that was supposed to stay in the office, with that second batch. And so the first month, maybe the first two weeks, I was pulling, I didn't have any hair left, but um, I was, you know, I was really nervous because essentially we weren't getting consent forms in and we were getting electronic consent and it was because they were sending the consent homes form. And so we, we changed the experiment a little bit and we started saying, look, when we receive the consent form, that's when we'll kind of activate the money that we were giving for tax professionals who were doing this. But the one thing that you'll see here, while it doesn't impact in our dependent sample, the balance, so this value here is a p-value on an f-test that these ratios are equivalent. In our independence, we start to actually lose the randomization that we had. There's some groups that were getting the consent form back a little bit more. And you can see here when you compare this column, you know, if you just look at this column here as a, as a ratio with this as the denominator, we're losing about 25% of our sample. Okay. Now, we think we're balanced. If we, in the sophomores and juniors, if you just look at any of the characteristics and then you look at the kind of T statistics on the differences, we don't find anything that's significant. Um, I would have put stars on it, you know, because I'm just trying to get more differences on here than the standard errors. If we did an F test on kind of the joint significance of, or insignificance of this, we basically can't reject that basically all these differences are zero, which is what you want to see. Um, just to give you a, a couple of, of places, you know, in, in uh, the Hispanic population in Ohio just basically doesn't exist, so that's why that number is so low. The African American population is actually very close to the national average, so we're quite overrepresented here in the sample that's going to H&R Block offices. The other thing that's interesting is the adjusted gross income, it's about 22,000. Um, I actually have data on all the FAFSA filers in 2000, and the, the mean in 2000 was actually around $50,000 in Ohio for FAFSA filers, so quite a bit lower. It's about 68% of the parents say, oh, we're definitely interested in knowing more about college for our sophomore or junior. Okay. 
Um, I, I wanted to put up here some of the dependent students. So this is the high school seniors. And the high school seniors here, we have the control group, the FAFSA group, and the information group. They look pretty balanced as well. The, um, there's low samples because we had to focus on the 17-year-olds. The incomes are in the similar range as what we saw with the other dependents. Um, most of those students are actually current high school students, although a, a, some of them had actually finished at the time of it. And again, overrepresented African American re re relative to the rest of the population. Um, by contrast, this is what the independents look like. So this is the independents who'd never been to college. And you can see their incomes are quite a bit lower because they're not relying on their parents. Their ages, they're somewhere in their mid-26s. Um, here's the students who had prior college experience. Their incomes are a little bit higher. This is uh, returns to schooling. We think some college might matter. Uh, they're also just a tiny bit older than the other sample. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to just kind of jump right in and show you our first results. So this is the first year after they graduated, did they file a FAFSA? So our 10th graders, 40% of them in the control group filed a FAFSA. The difference is about one percentage point if you're in our treatment group. Now, for those of you who, who have had your regression class and are thinking about your regression class, our standard error is pretty big here. It's 2.5%. So if you think about, you know, kind of a 95% confidence interval is going to be kind of two times that plus or minus. So that's a big number, right? That goes between 5% up or 5% down from what we're at. So that could actually be a fairly big range. We could have something as big as 4% or, as, as, or something, you know, negative 4%. So here's the 11th graders. Again, big standard error, very close to zero, nothing statistically significant. If you pull them, it starts to pull down the, sta the standard error here because we're essentially getting a much larger sample. But we basically are finding no effect on this likelihood that they complete it. Now, the 2% still might be a pretty big standard error, right? Because it still could be a 3% effect or, or lower. So a different way to say it is here's our 10th and 11th graders. Here's those 12th graders that we did offer the uh, information to. Here's independents who had no prior college experience. Here's independents. What if we pooled all these, controlled for which group they're in, and tried to see what it tells us on information overall? And when we pull those numbers together, you get something 0 0.003, and now the standard error is actually around 1%. So we're looking now at a range somewhere between you know, 1.7 or negative 1.7. It's tightened that range quite a bit. But this is just on filing the FAFSA, and we're basically finding that providing this information just did not influence the likelihood that families filed the FAFSA later on. We provided the information on returns to everybody, and uh, this extra information telling what their benefit might be if they filed a FAFSA, what, what the costs were, no impact whatsoever. But of course, if it's not going to affect this, you can guess what the rest of the presentation is basically going to show you here. Here's uh, college attendance. Zero, 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 and a 1% uh, standard error. Um, if you look at on the likelihood of them getting financial aid, zero, 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 zero with the one percent center. It's the first time I've had like precision in my zero in the actual. <laughs> you know, w w w we kind of didn't believe it. I mean, in particular, I think Bridget just wanted information to matter. We looked through basically, you know, things on whether they, uh, how much the aid was, uh, their take up of the aid. Um, the only thing we found a significant difference was students who had participated in our treatment filed their FAFSA two weeks earlier than the other kids. That was the only difference that we found across any of those. And of course, it's not going to stand up to kind of a, a multiple, uh, you know, a multiple uh, hypothesis testing. Um, but that was the only thing that we found that was anywhere different between those two groups. Now, we said, well, let's look at some interesting subsamples. So in some of our prior work, we found that students who were very interested in college were more receptive to these programs. Zero. We also found that students who said that work was a barrier to them going to college were more receptive to these programs. Zero. Uh, the families who took a loan immediately for the rebate or did not, zero, zero. Males, females, black, white, zero, 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 zero. Um, the only subsample that seemed to have a significant difference was those who were not very interested in college. And then, you know, it, you know we kind of chalk that up to multiple hypothesis tests, and we just, there's, there's no way that that's going to stand up to be something that's significant. Um, now, I wanted to show you what we found before to kind of then try to think about putting these in context. 
So in our prior study, this was the high school seniors. The control group, 40% of them went to college, uh, or excuse me, 40% of them filed a FAFSA. It was about 16 percentage points higher if they were in our treatment. And remember, the big difference here was, one, they were high school seniors, but we were all doing both information and assistance with these individuals. The group that we did assistants who were grade 12, we saw them earlier here. Uh, that was their numbers here in terms of whether or not there was a likelihood on their filing the FAFSA. But the group who are grade 12 here that uh, basically we provided uh, the full treatment with the assistance and the information, it was 16 percentage points higher. Their college attendance, 34 percent went to college, it was 8 percent higher if they received that extra assistance. Um, if we use kind of a, a bigger measure where we use the Department of Ed data, it's about a 10 percentage point or 11 percentage point increase in the likelihood they're going to college. And these are big effects if only 30 percent of them are going. These are one-third increase in going to college and the big difference is we're just helping with the FAFSA and giving that, that information. Um, these are the independent students. So the first column here showing uh, filing the FAFSA, you see 16 percent who'd never been to college filed the FAFSA in the control group. It was up by 27 percentage points, 32 percent in the students with some prior, and that was up 20 percentage points. In terms of going to college, it's about a two percentage point increase in college with this measure, a three percentage point increase with this measure. The other students is basically zero. You know, um, in terms of the amount of aid they're getting, uh, their likelihood of attending college, this is the result we saw. This is actually looking at persistence. If you look at this one down here, enrolled in college for two consecutive years, um, you'll see that the eight percentage point effect goes three years after the project. But what's interesting is it's actually negative here. One of the things that was happening in that FAFSA experiment was it was getting students who might, some students, about 4%, were coming from students who wouldn't have gone to college and now go to college. The other 4% were going from students who would have gone the next year, but now go a year earlier. Okay? And that's what really that, that information and assistance was doing. But regardless, three years later from the time we did the experiment, they'd at least, they were much more likely to have actually finished two full years of college. Okay? Um, so then the hard part is, is you start to back this out, well, what's really going on here? So the, the question that was asked earlier about, was this really about finishing things in the office? Now, we didn't have a good experiment here. Like in, in hindsight, we wish we would have. All we observed was uh, people could choose whether to finish it in the office or take it home. And what we actually find is if we, as we look at it, the file rate was 82% if they finished it in the office. Um, and 82% because sometimes it'd be kicked back to ask for more information and they may not have completed it. If we gave them a piece of paper and they said they would do it on their own, it was only about 14%. So we think that a lot of it is kind of this kind of, um, you know, in some sense, catching them when they're kind of thinking about it and giving them that little nudge at the right moment with that assistance. Now, in terms of information, this is kind of the depressing part for us. There's just no impact. You know, we, we've, we've got 15,000 people here that we've you know, run this experiment on and we don't find anything in terms of information. So the question is, well, what's the issue here? Well, the first part is maybe the problem is we just didn't go early enough. Maybe it's not enough to tell a sophomore uh, about the cost of college. Maybe we have to rewind it and go to middle school or maybe elementary school. Or, you know, I found out today that, you know, my, my, my sister-in-law is expecting, you know, I'm going to send her a, a little recording of me talking about college finance to play for the baby. You know, are you, I don't know at what point, but I mean, maybe we have to go earlier. Um, the second one is we could have the wrong information. Maybe it's not really the cost of college or the amount of aid I get. Maybe it's more about the experience of college, helping me see that the kind of cost of that study and the hard work might actually uh, be as high as I think. What's interesting is you start to think about it, there's kind of two, most of the studies that are looking at the attendance decision on whether to go to college, basically find that information doesn't matter when you look at it, as an example of the, the kind of Netherlands study on take up of that loan. Um, the exception to that is in developing countries, uh, there's a nice paper, um, UCLA, uh, what's his name? Rob Hansen, Jensen, Jensen sorry, has a paper uh, from Dominican Republic where he's basically giving people information about the returns to kind of secondary school and he finds uh, massive changes in enrollment there. But the studies that we have that actually suggest that there's an impact, almost always that impact is happening in terms of where they decide to go and not whether they decide to go. Okay. Um, so how do we insert as well is not just here's some information, but was it sort of an ongoing 
ongoing coaching support? So our HOGS and Turner, it provided both information, but they had different treatment arms. And the treatment arm that is that was the cheapest and the most effective was a treatment arm where basically they were providing fee waivers and some coaching on how to use those fee waivers to apply to those colleges. So again, it had an element of information, but it also had an element of assistance as well. Um, so, uh, you know, I actually really want to see this paper, but Caroline has decided not to present it at Stanford because she's too busy in the East Coast presenting it, is what she said. Uh, <laughs> she lives there. Okay. Um, so then, how do you start to think about it? And this is a place where I think there's an opening, uh, for those of you who are able, thinking about behavioral. You know, trying to figure out little ways to give nudges to try to help uh, individuals. And I'm not necessarily saying you know, that this is one of those, but for, for some reason, the psychological costs, we don't have a good measure of how tangible these are for students. And if we really think the human capital model is the right framework, there's got to be costs or, or benefits, kind of either benefits disappearing or costs appearing that we're not capturing in what we're doing. Okay. Um, the final thing, you know, and I'm going to just kind of show you two more slides here and then let's talk. Um, you know, the first bullet point just basically is a summary of everything we have. We just find zero, 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 and we actually, in the, in the end, have fairly tight standard air bands. So then the question is, is this the end of information? Can we just drive a stake in and say information doesn't matter, you know, it's information and assistance? And I think that uh, there, there might be a case to be made for that, but the one thing about information is it's so cheap. And even if we were to find that information had a one percentage point increase in the likelihood of students going to college, it would probably pass a cost-benefit analysis because it's so cheap. Um, the other one is we're focusing on a very specific sample, a sample of students whose parents go to H&R Block. So as you think about it, you know, there's a lot of other populations out there who might be more sensitive to information and more receptive to it um, than, than the setting we had. So, a few different things just in terms of what we actually have. You know, when, it, when we think broadly about this kind of overall intervention where we actually provided the assistance and the information, you know, I, earlier I mentioned these were some of the different problems we see in the process. We, when we were actually assisting people with the FAFSA, it was taking us about eight minutes to do so. Um, and when you did that assistance and the information, these were the benefits you seemed to have. They filed their FAFSA, they went to college, they received aid, they were, had a, a higher attainment. But the point here, only the information, it just doesn't seem to actually be the thing that's actually moving things. And, and so that's one of the places in the limitation. So the final slide, uh, just to kind of tell you what we're doing right now, um, the VITA sites are the kind of free tax sites. And what we uh, have funding to do right now is to try to expand this service into all of the VITA sites. And so uh, this year we actually ran uh, a pilot in about 144 offices where basically the office would just provide this service uh, for anybody who came in and wanted to complete their FAFSA. And we actually put it right in the software, working with the software provider for all the VITA sites. Uh, we've randomized at the office level, so some offices receive this, other offices don't. Um, there's some problem with there. The biggest problem for scalability is the people who run these offices and the people who maintain the software, there's no model to get revenue here. And so one of the things right now, our grants are basically supporting the company who provides the software to maintain that software, but that's the kind of sustainability problem in terms of the long run. So we're hoping in 2014 that this will actually be in all the Vita sites. It'll certainly embe be embedded in their software. Uh, we'll still have a randomization happening to try to see if the scale-up is leading to uh, differences in offices in terms of enrollment rates, but that's where we're at in this. And if it gets to the Vita sites, um, you know, this is actually going to be a big one because that's our way, you know, we've got two and a half million kids across the country whose parents do their taxes here at Vita sites. Uh, yeah, Michigan actually was a, uh, is an interesting case for us because the Vita site, the biggest Vita site here is actually a mobile Vita site uh, where they literally, it's, it's a set of laptops in a car and they basically drive to schools and set up a Vita site for a day. Um, so it's one of the places we're thinking about the randomization that if we can actually get them to randomize instead of at the office level at the where we park the car for the night um, that we actually might have a, 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 a nicer research project. Okay, so that's what I have. Um, you know, big picture. The information just doesn't seem to do it a lot by itself, and there seems to be something more to the puzzle. And I'm happy to you know, field your questions and talk a little bit more about information here. You said that the um, other effects people find from information are typically about which school people go to. Yeah. Can you measure that in your data? So the problem we have is they're really dispersed. Um, the one thing that we can say is that, so in the 
uh, high school sophomores and juniors, we don't find any impact on attendance. And when we look institution by institution, you, we just don't have enough power to actually identify an effect for individual institution. When we do that for the overall, what we actually found was uh, Sinclair and Ohio University were actually the two biggest recipients. And those were places where actually, you know, it increased and almost doubled the number of students who were going to those respective schools. But in the high school and sophomores prog program, we don't find anything on, on which college in terms of it affecting it. Sorry to be clear, you're being just to the information. Just the information. Well, no, so the, j just the information, we find nothing in ours in terms of where they go to school. When we did assistance and information, that was the Ohio and Sinclair. Maybe try collapsing these to tiers so that maybe... That's, uh, that's a good idea to do that. I mean, we haven't... Uh, we, should, we can do something more nuanced. We've actually looked at whether it increased the likelihood of them going to one of the four schools that we listed on their form, and we didn't find anything there. Um, but, but, but that's worthwhile to kind of collapse it by, the, by you know, selectivity, although most of these students are not you know, thinking about highly selective schools. Yes? In one of your slides, you mentioned that perhaps you should um, go earlier, give the information earlier. Yeah. Um, and so I'm wondering, for the, the sophomores and juniors, for example, it, it may be for them that at that moment, they're not thinking about college yet. So maybe it's actually like And it's actually their earlier. parents, right? It's their parents that. Well, so, and so in my mind, I'm thinking like, I know if my mom would have received that information, she wouldn't have known what to do with it. She would have just probably passed it off to me. And my junior year, I wasn't thinking. Yeah, but the hard part, right, is when we provided it their senior year, it didn't change either. Yeah, and um, you know, a different way to go with it is to go, and, and a, a different way to kind of couch a lot of the sociological interventions that are happening, you know, the, the, the kind of operative word is changing the college culture, right? And if I try to translate that to what I think it means in economic terms, it's a more realistic picture of both the costs and benefits of college, but also a more realistic kind of expectation of the social norms, as well as the potential individual costs that may be non-financial that students might have from going to college. And so, you know, in some sense, maybe that's the right information that somehow changing the way that they think about it, that might somehow change their perception of the kind of non-monetary costs. And I think that that's one place where, um, you know, there's, there's I, I wouldn't say there's good experimental evidence, uh, but certainly it's a place where a lot of people have explored and seem to suggest that there's a relationship there, but we're just not finding it. Um, let's go back here. It's Mark. Yes. Um, have you thought about changing up the delivery method of the information? Like if you look at like um, Dinkelman and Martinez and their experiment in Chile and Oriopolis and Dunn, I mean they use, they use videos. Yeah. I mean, have you thought about like changing up the intervention? You know, we didn't have a lot of, uh, we didn't have a lot of well, first off, remember that we're, you know, in some sense, we, we preceded all of them. Like, Oriopolis was actually yeah, designing yeah. the videos. I guess the yeah. Would be yeah. The like. You know, our, in, in our setting, we didn't have that opportunity to do that. Um, you know, Phil was a, you know, Oriopolis and Dunn, you know, Phil was working on this project with us. And Phil was basically, he's one of the co-authors. And we were trying to figure out kind of a more creative way. Uh, but we had the limitation of in terms of both how long they would allow us to give information. Um, we tried, uh, we were allowed in the 2009 tax season to actually send an email reminder to each family about the information at a later date. Um, but, they, but then uh, basically as the, you know, within two weeks of tax season ending, H&R uh, Block actually fired everybody affiliated with the project in 2009. And so a lot of that data is, is just gone. Um, please. So, um, is, is there any indication whether, or is there any way to tease out whether or not um, assistance without information? This, <coughs> I mean, that's a great point. I mean, in retrospect, we wish we would have done both assistance and information, information and then assistance. Uh, but it was one of those things we didn't realize how important the assistance. I mean, I think while most of us were optimistic that there'd be something from information, because at the time there was so much rhetoric around information. And so you, when it, there was nothing, it was like, well, we would have loved to see, you know, if we just handed them a form, oh, here's a form you should fill out without really interpreting if it mattered. Um, that was one of the things we have, we've, we are trying to get in the Vita sites right now to have a, some offices where it's just assistance without any explanation. Um, the hardest part that we're just having in that one is uh, we haven't been able to negotiate to get that in a set of offices right yet. Yeah. Um, and using economic thinking, um, I'm wondering about demand for college. and. Before that, 
demand for like grades <coughs> six through twelve school schooling. Yeah. Um, because there are all kinds of indicators that for grades six through twelve, the average kid is not too thrilled about school, going yeah. to school. And even in college, and this crosses income levels, even in college there are reports like at UCLA honors class, somebody teaching that said the hardest, the most challenging part of a of a thesis for these honors students was coming up with a, a topic. They didn't have passionate interests. That sounds like a dissertation problem too. But this, these were undergrads. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. These were undergrads. They, he, this person was bringing it up to say there's been no cultivation of, of interests and passions, which fits with so much data. So I'm wondering um, when, you, when it gets to information, if there might be interactions, if there were more going on as of, say, really robust middle school um, information about, you know, the reason you go to college is to be you, to, to yeah. really develop your strengths. Or, I mean, it, it's, uh, and this goes back to also like Cherry's surveys, you know, UCLA surveys over time showing this kind of flip in what student, the reason students say they'd like to go to college and having it be much more about, you know, uh, career and job and earnings rather than about, you know, uh, some other more ethereal, you know, or more self, you know, it, exactly. And so I don't know exactly. The one thing that's, that though is interesting is when we did that group where all we did was augment it with the assistants, it stuck. I mean, one of the worries we had was that they were going to show up in college and they were, if, if they weren't responsible enough to do a FAFSA, that they were going to be gone as soon as college started. But they stuck. So part of it, you know, so, so in some sense I agree with you um, that there, there, there's something else that, that needs to be done. But for those some students who we gave that information and the assistance, that seemed to be enough to kind of get them to actually really change the course of action. And, and I think that's great. And I think, I mean, I think what you're doing is, is fabulous, and especially the automated information and so forth. And I kind of think of it all as schooling behavior and education, like health behavior and education. Yeah. Anything you can do to influence the, the behavior. And I, that's what makes me think interactions could be interesting looking at different types of information when you put them together. Is there even more of an effect? Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, the hard part is, you know, in some sense, the, the hardest part with information is we, when do we stop and say we've got all the right? And, and when do we stop in terms of in their, when in their lifetime to give it and what in terms of what to give them? There, there might be some strands that are pretty yeah. fundamental to say is there something missing, given that I think there's a lot indicating there's low demand. Um, Ag agreed. Period. No, I, I think that's, that's worthwhile to go down. Monica, did you have? Uh, I was going to say a related comment, which is uh, low-income families uh, might have like a system of beliefs which is hard to change just with one shot information. Yeah. So maybe like providing the same information in several ways, more like in a coaching manner, might have like that change in the set of beliefs instead of one shot. That's right. I, I mean, and that's one of the weaknesses in this approach. The delivery mechanism, going back to the earlier question, it's just a one shot thing, and maybe that's not the right marketing as well as the right. We hear evaluation is relevant here, though, for both of these questions. Right, so there's a randomized evaluation of Europe, yeah. which is much more intensive in high school, you know, multi-year, lots of yeah. support, zero. So, <laughs> sorry. I mean, here's the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'm wondering about if you've considered testing this on a purely, like, online-based tax service, like TurboTax or something. So well, I'm wondering whether the tax professional matters or So we, we contacted TurboTax, and TurboTax basically stuck the problem. They didn't have a revenue model here. And not only that, but because the Department of Education wouldn't let them electronically transmit, it actually generated more cost for them to print the information in an organized way for the individual. And so TurboTax um, in 2008 and 2009 had TurboTax with FAFSA support, and they killed, the, they killed it. Um, now, it's, it's possible that they return to it once the Department of Ed makes the change. But you know, in our conversations with them, they're just like, look, there's nothing there for us. We can't make any money off this. It's not bringing in new clients to us. It's, it's not clear what to do. I think the social venture MPP Ross group needs to take this off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good uh, case study. So do you have um, any way of measuring whether people believed the information that they were taught? No. I mean, that's what I would have, like, I would have loved to have gone, you know, kind of like in the Netherlands experiment and actually, you know, contact a subsample to just say, 
hey, we told you this information. Can you give us a ballpark of what the costs are and what your eligibility might be? But no, we, I mean, for us, we had one touch with these individuals, and that's all that H&R Block would allow us. Once they left the office, um, never more. Yeah. In this study, did you all ask about whether or not the students were first generation college students? We did, and, and for our subsample of, um, you know, for the subsample whose parents had uh, prior college experience, you know, we, we didn't find anything of the information whatsoever. Um, the ones where they had a sibling who had previously been to college, in the full treatment where we did assistance and information, there was an impact there, um, but there wasn't any other impact in terms of the information only groups. Please. Um, you talked about personalized information. Is there a way to link the students' high school and the students who have gone to particular colleges from that high school and include that in the packet? Yeah, so in ours, there we didn't because all we knew was the zip code of residence. Um, we probably could have put that in there, but we didn't. Um, one that I'm working on right now um, in terms of trying to provide information in kind of like a matching type strategy is what we have is the history of the school. Uh, for, by history, I mean the last five years, everywhere that anybody's attended college, a National Student Clearinghouse match. And so what we can do is basically, if is for each student basically, based on their college entrance exam score and their GPA, we can say, look, you know, students from your school have previously attended school X. And so we're trying to think about some kind of social psychology experiments about the framing of that information. And, and you know, some, if, if you know Jeff Cohn, Greg Walton's work, you know, they, their work suggests that framing of that information might actually lead to a difference in kind of the willingness to believe it and internalize it. So, you know, we're going to test the theory and see, and see if we get the same, similar results to what they do. Itself. How does this change your view of the role of informational interventions in encouraging social benefit to up more generally? And how do we think about this versus other, other programs? Uh, Asking you to speculate. I, I mean, the hard part here is, is you know, going back to that slide where if information matters, even in the smallest amount, it might be cost effective. Um, but the hard part is, I'm, I'm, you know, like my personal prior is I, I've yet to see a place where information matters. And, you know, if we started to try to think about, you know, some statistical way of combining these repetitive zeros we're seeing, um, you know, I, I might be convinced, you know, more fully convinced that, you know, if there's an effect, it's so small that it's, it, we're never going to be able to actually measure it precisely. Um, having said that, um, you know, I'm also open that there's different populations as well as different types of information. You know, some of the things in our discussion earlier uh, that, that might actually be ways to actually find it. So I don't think it's worth kind of giving up on it. Um, but more generally, you know, I've started to think a little bit that it's a bit of a, you know, now I'm going to use some stronger words, that it's more of a, a cop-out. That it's, you know, it's a way of saying we have to do something. Politically, we need to be observed doing something. So let's do this thing because it's a low-cost venture. Um, but yet there's no evidence that it actually does anything. And, and so that's, you know, when, when I'm on those calls, that's, that's the frustration I have. Yeah, I mean, the, the cop-out story is one I resonate to. But I think as a, as a just as a whatever person, um, there's just a big puzzle here. Yeah. Because in some sense that we, we think, I mean, if, in fact, people think it's costly to go to college. I mean, that should have an impact. They say they think it, it's financially beneficial. So there's, there's something that there's some something doesn't square here. That's and, exactly and figuring out what doesn't square. It seems to me. I don't know whether it has a high social return, but it has, seems like it has a high social science return to figuring out what what. Well, that the no, I think that's exactly right because I mean there is a. The, it's hard to think that all of these individuals are acting irrationally. There is something very tangible in what they're thinking, and it's a matter of us trying to figure out: do we have the wrong model for capturing it, or do we not understand it? And and that's why you know I put up the slide about the psychological cost because I think that that's a good candidate to start looking at. That perhaps the the kind of myopia that individuals have, or the willingness to procrastinate. Um, actually are sizable costs that might actually in a short run actually drown out some of those cost-benefit analysis. I mean, I think there's potential here that One is that 
the, this guy, my, whatever it is, the myopia. I mean, I resonate to that. Yeah. Um, the other one is this, like, not credit, the lack of credibility of the information. Yeah. In, in just in the sense of, you know, I get all this, you know, it seems like now online, you know, there's more, you have to figure out how to click out of those. And, I mean, you know, and it's sort of like every ad, I just know it's telling, trying to sell me something I don't want. Yeah. And I'm trying to teach my kids. I mean, but it's, it's like almost a rule. Don't believe anything. I mean, because almost anything. And I mean, by God, you could find somewhere on the internet. I mean, and maybe it's a, what, what's happened with information, too. You know, uh, whatever it is, Obama is a Jewish Islamic terrorist. I mean, I, I literally, you can find a site that tell, says that he's both Jewish and Islamic. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you know. So, but then you don't believe anything. So you sort of turn every, I mean, so that's, that's a different, ex I mean, I'm just picking up on the kind of explanation. Yeah. But then figuring out, is it that people just distrust everything, which they should, or is it they're procrastinators, which they are? <laughs> They sort of, no scientific, this is all like. But you know, no, but I think that your, your bigger point, which is there's an intellectual puzzle here yeah. that has enormous social impact, is, is exactly right. And so it's an area where it's, it's fertile for people to work in because if we can figure out how to close that gap, we think that there's a real social benefit both in terms of inequality but also in terms of economic growth that could be realized. So no, I think that it, your, your point's right on. I mean, in some sense, you know, we're running a very limited experiment on a larger puzzle, and we're not making any headway on that puzzle. I'm puzzled why we're puzzled. Right? So we're not puzzled. So you know, we uh -huh. tell people you really should be actually, you know, running five miles a week <laughs> and eating better, and but and they don't. And do we think that sending them another flyer that says that they should do that is? And we realize we just sort of, and, and I think in health, we come to the conclusion we have to be more sophisticated in our interventions. So when I when I, I hear people in education being puzzled that the information is I'm like, duh. I'm just going to say, there's a difference between running five miles a day for many of us and not, I mean. School is as painful for many people. No, no, but that's the or point. That is that you get the, the thing is, you get the person to actually, you submit the, the difference is, the puzzle is not, the puzzle is that when you actually send in the FAFSA, some fracture of those people not only go, they don't only just show up the first guy in a day and right. find out it sucks and leave. They stay, stay for there, two right? years. That's the puzzle. Right. And yeah. so you don't tell me, the, you, yes, people feel as, you know, whatever, people don't like school. But then why don't those, it's the puzzle is the different. That's the puzzle. And I don't think, I understand this, program. I mean, I understand all these things, but it's like, you know, the misery that I would get from running every day, just far, I mean, or maybe it is. I think the analysis so that the healthcare actually is when people avoid getting information about their health, uh, getting, avoiding getting a diagnostic test that if it revealed something would give them, so I think that's the closest analog actually. No, I disagree. Oh, I think okay. all of these things are different <laughs> because, because I don't, there's a very good, re I don't want to find, you know, Arlene tells me I should find out whether I'm, you know, I have whatever early onset uh, dementia. I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so as, as a point of, uh, so, so first thing, uh, you know. For doctoral students, this is a, a good strategy when you're giving a talk: is get people actually defending or uh, you know to, to move forward. The second thing is, uh, at times you have to step in a little bit and just kind of bring it back. Because I think the point is, because I think the the bigger point that you've made effectively is there's a puzzle here as to why that little bit of assistance has such a big effect, and a puzzle as to why this simple change in kind of them calibrating costs has no impact whatsoever. And both of those are very open questions that we just, we, you know, we didn't solve. Um, and that bigger question about how to close the gap, you know, we've tried something that was, seemed to be kind of, at least from policy, something that people were thinking about actively as a solution, and we just didn't find any traction with it. It strikes me that, like, so these are low-income people seeking out assistance and navigate a complex process to yeah. their taxes, right? So it, it seems to me then to give them information and then say, go navigate this complex process that, and there's $4,000 at the end of the rainbow for you, is equally, you know, it might not just be that these people 
people don't have the capacity to do that. So that's, I think that's the population issue, right? This is a yeah. population with low. Mm -hmm. well, this is this is the target population for the Pell, for example. Right. I mean, you know, 75, 80 percent, 90 percent of yeah, you see 75 percent. Yeah, exactly. Use something like H and R Block. Right. So this is and this is the target population for the Pell. So. So if, if we want the Pell to hit them, we need to do it. Yeah. <coughs> Let's go here and then we'll come back over. You mentioned that there are a lot of uh, different policy initiatives to promote the information because even though it doesn't seem to just have an effect, but just the information it doesn't seem to be an effect, it's a low cost thing to do. But yeah. do you know if there are any other policy initiatives to combine that information with assistance? Because it seems to be well, the high speed of Turner is, is a great piece uh, as an example here. Because it's, it's an example where data exist. So the data exists at the College Board, which, where we can identify every student's kind of college entrance. And we can identify students at particular high schools that seem to have kind of a, a low rate of kind of going to, challenging themselves to go to a good one, uh, the best possible institution. And so we can target an intervention very narrowly based on information that we have to, in some sense, uh, both provide information and provide appropriate assistance. It's, it's harder for us to actually uh, have that information in other sectors. I mean, one of the things that's very hard is to walk into a high school. And, you know, sometimes we can walk into a high school and know that it's going to be the whole population. But if you have a, a population that's very diverse in terms of its socioeconomics, sometimes it's hard to go in and figure out which are the students that might actually need the help. Now, there are uh, you know, some people who've discussed, for example, using free reduced lunch and eligibility for other benefits as a proxy for eligibility here. And there's certainly a thing, that, the, a case to be made that they're, that lowering the barrier might actually uh, improve students' take-ups of it. I mean, one of the hard parts in you know, kind of trying to play the other side a little bit is it's not like we created the FAFSA and said, let's have the most complex form on the face of the earth, right? The FAFSA became complex for a number of different reasons. And in particular, as now we started to move towards an era where the FAFSA has become simpler and simpler, although I'm not quite sure how far we've gone down that road, But what's happened is institutions who are not getting the information they wanted have now started to require you know, the, the CSS profile and other types of ways of acquiring that information. So there's information that, uh, that institutions want, and if the FAFSA is not going to get it, they're going to find another mechanism for identifying that information. Yeah? Um, you mentioned at one point that maybe we're not giving the right kind of information or the right information. Was that a statement on the accuracy of these estimates, or do you think there's a different I think it comes back to the earlier point that there are these domains of information that might be more salient. We thought the cost and a personalized estimate of the benefit was a good starting point. Maybe that's the wrong place. Maybe what we need to do is, is provide information that says, you know, it helps them understand how much effort it's going to take them to succeed in college. Maybe that's what we need to do. There's other kinds of informational domains that we could have looked at. Um, these were the two that we chose. And we didn't get any traction with them, but it doesn't. It's it, it, you know. It's not to say that information doesn't matter. These two domains don't seem to matter. Yeah. Did you collect whether or not the students' um, EFCs were validated by their institution? So were they flagged for verification? Um, in our sample, we actually had a lower rate of of uh, kind of 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 er one of the things they do is an internal check to see if the data seemed to make sense. We had a much lower error rate in the places where we did the assistance. Um, you know, and the information, given that there was no impact on uh, filing, we didn't go down that road any further. Yeah? In terms of like the human capital theory piece, I'm thinking about how to shift information. Perhaps it's not so much, and taking in the realization that a lot of kids are now, they're verbalizing their motivation for going to college being about economic benefits in the long run, right? Yeah. So workforce, career goals, maybe that's part of how you tailor the information in future iterations of yeah. this for somebody else does is talking about the benefits, those economic benefits, not simply the immediate ones about how to pay for college, but like why kids want to go to college and, and what and that try to do that. And, and in our problem, the problem was our IRB forced us to give the benefits to everyone. Uh, and so in some sense, we couldn't actually do any tests on that. You know, the, the Oreopolis and Dunn, that is one of the big parts that they're trying to do there is really kind of market the benefits in a different way. And, and they find at least in students kind of stated intent to go to college, they don't actually observe college enrollment, but in their stated intent, they're finding impacts on their likelihood that they're saying they're going to college. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you can get any insight on the basic puzzle by 
um, talking with some community leaders, even contacts through Stanford's um, John Gardner Center, perhaps, because they have contacts with low-income communities. It could be interesting to see just qualitatively what yeah. some community leaders who really understand the population might say about the puzzle. Well, I mean, one of the things, in, 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 as we've done this, I mean, we've actually, you know, for example, when we were doing Ohio, we were highly engaged with the Board of Regents and highly engaged with the local superintendents around in trying to kind of acquire some of the information about what they thought uh, we should do and whether their populations would, would take advantage of it. And, you know, there was a number of superintendents who were, you know, very gung-ho. They didn't fully understand. They thought that we could even bring H&R Block to all their high schools. And so they, they viewed this as, as really a place where, as, as being the kinds of information that they thought their students needed. But the superintendents are like us. We're removed. Yeah. And so that's why I'm thinking that true community leaders who know these, yeah. the population might at least kind of um, speak to the puzzle a bit just to try to, um, I don't know, just help you think about it. The, the one other one that we're, we're working on is, is going kind of a different direction where you know, there's a number of different advising programs in high schools and then some of those, uh, you know, uh, the person who is doing the advising is kind of closer to the phenomenon. And so like one that uh, you know, we've done some work with is the advising core, which is like Teach for America, but they put a, 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 you know, kind of a recent college graduate. And so trying to see if there's a way to actually change their delivery mechanism uh, to see what they're getting, you know, in some sense, because they have that relationship of trust and proximity. But, you know, that's all very much in its infancy. There was another hand. So what I take from your findings is not, um, we found, here's something else that doesn't work, but that the assistance worked enormously and it's cheap. Is it like 79 bucks per participant? It, it was much cheaper than that even. I okay. mean, the 79 bucks uh, was actually because we were also paying the tax professionals uh, to do that, right. to, to ask the questions, and, and we were paying participants. And 79 bucks yeah. Impact. Yeah. There are kids going on for two years. Yeah. So the sales job, I think, on this is that this is a really cheap intervention that does a lot. <laughs> As social sciences, we're like, why? Why yeah. does it work? Yeah. Look, it works. It's cheap, so just do it. Well, well, I think the other part that the reason I don't, I'm not accentuating that as hard uh, is because you know, one of the hard parts here is you know, we've already published paper number one, which said, you know, here's this assistance and information. It really works. And now, you know, this embedded project that we thought would be interesting, just finding information just doesn't matter. You know, that's the paper that, that's to be written. And we're going to come back to this assistance point, but, you know, that was the real focus of this particular intervention. And so that's why, at least in a frame, but I take your point wholeheartedly. And that's why, you know, I tried to put those previous results in there to show the contrast between those information results and the others. Okay, the fact that people are leaving. Um, how are the Red Sox doing? Have, have, did you get the score? I guess the game's not... <laughs> Game's not up yet. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so thank you very much. If you have other comments, uh, please feel free to come up and uh, talk to me about them. I'd be happy to get those comments. And again, thank you very much uh, for, for the discussion today.